trying to do communication with a secure server, and sometimes they're rolling their own kind of uh, protocol. So maybe you're using Google's protobufs, maybe you're just serializing objects to JSON. Um, and I've seen this in a lot of apps where people do, uh, you know, they've pro-guarded everything. They've checked for tamper detection. Um, and what they're actually trying to protect is their awesome server. So maybe let's, let's just pretend this is Yelp. Um, this actually isn't Yelp. Yelp's app's probably fine. I haven't looked at it, but probably not though. But let's just say they have a, a JSON service and they want to protect their JSON service, but they're sending up keys that are, you know, user name, user password, um, location of where to find food, what type of food I want to uh, find. So those are all constant strings inside their JSON objects. So if you're leaving those in there, it's going to be really easy for someone to be like, okay, well, that's their POJO where they're, um, where they're harnessing all that data from JSON. So yeah, they, maybe they programmed everything, but they actually are just using those same uh, constants, and it's just really easy to find. <clears throat> Another interesting one is I've seen a lot of people use debug code where they're using two string, and so they made these really nice functions so that when their developers are trying to debug something and they say like object whatever two string, they're dumping out like oh the username this and here's the variable where it maps to you know passwords this this is the variable it maps to. So basically you went from a pro guarded of I have no idea what a is other than it's a string, I have no idea what b is other than it's a string to let me just look at two string method and I can see that this is exactly what these ones would actually map to. Um, it was the same, like I said, for JSON parsing, XML parsing. Uh, a lot of people just don't notice that you know, you're trying to protect your service on a website, but you're not actually obfuscating any of those variables. Uh, I think WIT automates, automates this. I don't really know anyone who uses WIT anymore. I think they're phasing WIT out, actually. Uh, but it, it's an interesting concept to think of. Like Maybe you want to obfuscate the names of your actual services, or you know, instead of username, just use you, something simple like that. Um, as I had said before, strip out debug code. Uh, ProGuard will remove code that's unused, but if you're having like something in your application where it says, you know, if this is a debug build, run this debug code. Since it's still being referenced in your actual Java code, ProGuard, ProGuard doesn't know the difference necessarily. So it's going to say, well, you called it, so then it's not useless code, so I'm going to just still include that. And like I said, those debug functions are really easy for reversers to get a hold of, and it just leaves back a lot of interesting stuff like uh, you might see someone talking about um, you know a developer wants to authenticate to a QA server which might be exposed to the world and you left that code in there so now the reverser knows how to ping your QA code uh, maybe look for new features or oh this is a something that we're developing we haven't turned on yet but the developers have access to it and you actually ship that in production level code now you're kind of giving away like maybe some secrets that you don't want to give away to maybe a reverse engineer or a competitor um, basically, any debug information is just going to help those kind of people uh, reverse any the application. Um, another interesting concept is if you're ever talking to your server, you can always, you should always just never trust your client input. Uh, one way to look at it is never trust your actual system that your application is running on. If I'm a reverse engineer, I probably have a rooted phone. I have complete access to my device. This isn't a normal user. I can do whatever I want with my device. So certificate pinning is a really great uh, way to try and prevent this. It's kind of just throwing a monkey wrench at the reverser. It's not impossible to get around, but basically you're no longer um, trusting what the certificate authority is on the phone, because uh, as a reverser, we can just install our own one, and then we can just spoof all your certs. If you're doing certificate pinning, I'm actually gonna have to go in and change your code around so that I can you know, pin my own certificate, and it just becomes a much longer process than let me just set up this proxy, there you go, okay, that's fine, because I already had my phone set up for it. Uh, this is a really good way to just prevent those people from trying to man in the middle. Uh, it's a great way to prevent um, not only just people trying to pirate your application, but people trying to probe your servers, figure out what are valid responses to your server. It's just gonna slow people down a bit. Definitely raises the bar. Uh, so this brings me on to, well, how can we try and detect if our own package has been modified? Uh, one of the good ways uh, I've seen people used previously was, like I said, that package manager looking at your own certificate and seeing what, hap what happens. So anti-LBL, as I said, actually hooks this function call, and then I actually went a step further to hooking reflection. So anytime your program actually calls a reflective method, it's comparing it to a band, a band list of um, reflected methods that it doesn't want you to actually access. So if you try and reflectively access the package manager, you're like, well, we've seen someone try and do this before. 
So any reflection you're going to go, if you pass in the parameters for that object, they're going to feed you a fake one. So it's basically like they're mocking out your code, and they're going to basically still say, okay, well, you wanted what from that function? Okay, well, here, have this one because it's fake, and your application's never going to know the difference. So an interesting way to get around this would be, what if you just happen to you know, do a cycle redundancy check on your application? Do a quick checksum, you know, MD5 your own application, send it up to the server, and just use a value coming back. So on your server, you should know what your actual application is that you're submitting to the world. So you should know all the ones like, so if I get an MD5 that doesn't match any of the ones I've ever released, someone's done something to my file. So a really easy way to do this would be, oh, well, was it good or was it bad, and send back a boolean uh, flag. But you know that's, that's gonna be easy for someone to change. Um, ways people do this in games is something simple like, uh, you know, you, you sent up an MD5 or, you know, some kind of, um, some kind of check to see, like, what is my application still look like? And you send up those fingerprints and basically your code will then say, okay, well, you know, this is a game, so I'm going to change my gravity based on this. And if it's one that I've never seen, crank the gravity up and now nobody's going to be able to jump. They're not going to be able to get past that first monster or something like that. Um, and basically just change something so that the reverser doesn't know what the actual real value is, and it's gonna be harder for them to hard code this. And it might be something that changes, you know, based on the level or based on you know some some kind of component in your actual application. Uh, other ways to do this, uh, you can take a look at your certificate. So instead of just calling the package manager, you could uh, dynamically actually look inside your APK, view the assets, look at your certificate, was it signed by the same person? You know, was the actual validity date what I know my validity date. You know a lot of things that the reversers might not, or they might not be checking for any of this, and this is just gonna slow them down, and something like this might be mundane, but it might also mean that person just doesn't care to try to reverse your application anymore, because you're just doing things to make their, consume their time. Um, an interesting thing that came up is I was trying to just Google around, see if anyone came up with a solution for Lucky Patching. So this is the guy that uh, edits your runtime executable, and basically just uh, changes it so that if you were looking at your own package, you can't, um, you can't detect that anything's changed. So what it's doing is it's changing the file inside data down to cache. And uh, this is world readable, but not world writable. So you should be able to read your own. So you could run maybe like an MD5 sum on this, see what it actually comes out to be. Uh, and then the issue comes into, this is optimized per device. So you can't just own every single device and then run MD5s and be like, well, if it's on this list, then you know, let's, uh, let's let this person run it. So an interesting solution that comes up is uh, in the AOSP, uh, we actually have what's called the Dex op wrapper. So this is one for a developer to actually use to uh, optimize their Dalek file to see what they're using. And this just wraps the normal Dex op command, which is run by the devices when they install the APK. So one solution to this could be uh, basically, you're going to run a DexOp wrapper on your own application. So this is going to dump out a Dex file. And this should be exactly the same as the data down the cache copy. So if you did a difference between the two, or if you tried to, you know, does the MD5 here match the MD5 here, they should be different if someone's edited something. But this should always come back to be the same exact thing that is mapped there for that device. So that could be a quick and dirty way. Um, you know, once you do that, someone's probably going to say, okay, well, if I really want to crack your app, I can you know, then look at it, so it, it's a moving target. This is one easy way now, but as soon as you do it, it could be very easy for them to patch. Uh, essentially, the way Lucky Patcher works uh, is this is from its actual configuration file for one of the applications. It's doing a search for these specific bytes. These are basically wildcards, and then it's basically uh, looking for another byte here. And it's basically looking through that whole dex file, the, the old dex file, excuse me. <clears throat> and then it's basically saying that once I find this pattern, replace it with this. So this might be like present in the file 10 times, and this might, this is actually, I was looking at the bytecodes for this. Uh, this is an if statement that was basically saying if this variable that was previously defined up here is actually equal to true, then skip over this, otherwise do that. So when they're patching it, they're actually returning a different value here, uh, so that every single time someone comes in contact with this code, it's just a simple if statement. So the way you can avoid something like this is since they're just doing simple matching of bytes, you basically make a more complex program. So as I was saying, like uh, an is registered function might not be that great. It's really easy to patch. It's basically if 
this is true. That